everyone, I'm Nathan Shapura, Senior Political Advisor at the European People's Party. On behalf of the EPP, welcome to this special ed edition of EPP Family Talks. Today, we have the pleasure to welcome our EPP Secretary General, a member of the European Parliament from Partido Popular in Spain, Antonio Lopez Asturias. We also have guests from two American partner organizations, the International Republican Institute and the National Democratic Institute. From IRI, we have Jan Sarachak, Senior Director for Transatlantic Strategy, longtime friend of the EPP and of the Martin Center, an American who's committed to transatlantic relations, who speaks several European languages, and who I know is particularly close and close to and proud of his Slovak roots. From, from NDI, we have Director of Political Parties, Brigitte Olsen. She's been Director of Political Parties since April 2020. Uh, she is a former parliamentarian from the Liberal Party in Sweden and Sweden's former Minister for European Affairs and Democracy. Brigitte, Jan, Secretary General, welcome. Thanks so much to all of you for joining us today. Thank you. I thought I, thought I would jump right in with a question to our Secretary General. Our Secretary General is not only Sec uh, Secretary General of the Party, member of the European Parliament, you're also the chair of our working group on foreign policy in the party. And in that context, you have overseen uh, a new paper on transatlantic relations with the transition that's just happened in the, in the administration and in Congress. It's set to be published in a few days. And one of the things we focus on in that paper is how important multilateralism is, strengthening multilateral ties. And in particular, the, the need to work with partners on dem democracy support programs around the world. So the first question to you, why is this such an important point? Why was this such an important thing to include in our paper? Um, <clears throat> the United States, European countries, United Kingdom, we are democracies. This might be an overstatement several years ago, but uh, we are under attack. We are uh, on the threat that, including in many of our societies, there are people that they believe that maybe a more, let's say, um, authoritarian regime or, uh, you know, another approach, uh, subtle approach that like happened in the past, uh, to drive with uh, difficult periods of time, uh, like it happened in the 1930s and the 1920s in the past century. Uh, again, the same feeling that there might be other answers rather than democracy. And what unites us here today and what unites all the member parties of the EPP in that paper is to state very clearly that we are very proud and that we are going to fight for our democracies. Uh, we might be under threat from dictatorships and, uh, and regimes around us. We have the question of Turkey, of Russia, of China and uh, other, you know, uh, countries. Which system clearly is not democratic? We all know that or has been uh, in any way also changed uh, because uh, you know it's different China from Turkey of course in Turkey you have elections you have different parties uh, and not like in China but it's our duty uh, and I'm sure I, 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 I we share this vision uh, with our good friends of the IRI and the NDI uh, that we must fight and I've been working so many years with uh, members of uh, IRI and NDI in fighting for our democratic ideas. Uh, and you are doing, by the way, both offices, both organizations, you are doing an outstanding work in that sense. You did it in the past, but now it has to be more than ever. Uh, we have worked together in uh, many countries close to the European Union, in Moldavia, in Belarus, in Ukraine. Uh, and uh, we have big work to do because uh, we are under threat and uh, we will win this battle uh, but it's going to it's going to take time a pandemic economic crisis and many challenges are ahead of us you know have brought our societies also the division produced by the social media the let's say polarization of political choices uh, uh, us reasonable politicians reasonable political families and we have to uh, we have to work together in order to help again democracy prosper 
remember after the fall of the Berlin Wall, there was this cry, you know, that uh, this was the end of all tyrannies of all dictatorships, you know, the world was going to be different. Everybody was joining the democratic club. Where are we today? So reflections from this last year since 1999. What did we do wrong? What can we do better? And how to alleviate uh, the, the uh, pressure over our citizens? That they are sometimes inclined, uh, forced by the discussion, by the debates, uh, to choose between uh, regimes, democracy. We cannot allow this to happen. Uh, so I think it was a very good idea to have the representatives of both organizations that also are linked uh, to two, uh, two uh, you know, brothers and sisters of our, our parties in, in Europe, the Democratic Party and the Democrat Party and the Republican Party. And uh, let's work this together. And that was part of the sense of the paper that we did in the EPP. Uh, not because there is a change now of administration in the United States, it's not that any, everything changes. No, we have to continue the work. Whoever is president of the United States, from either side, this work has to continue. Presidents of the United States, uh, like parties, have different approaches. But our task, our duty, the one as we are here today, is to maintain the flame uh, of that work and that fight. Thank you. Thanks, Secretary General. I know this is uh, these are relationships with IRI with NBI that you have been committed to for many, many years. Just picking up on what you just mentioned, the continuity of administrations, despite a lot of changes, obviously, to both of our other panelists, to Jan and to Begiza, how do you see your role in IRI and in NDI now that there is a change of administration, there's a new Congress? Of course, there are so many other things happening in the world. We've just seen mass protests across Russia. We've seen mass protests in Belarus. How do you see the work of, uh, of each of your organizations now? Um, and I guess, how can how would you see the EPP's role as well as a potential partner in this? Maybe maybe first actually Brigitte and then to Jan. Thank, thank you so much for inviting me today to this conversation. And I, I just wanted to start off by saying that uh, the National Democratic Institute and the I, we're, we're unique uh, from that point of view that we have the long-term relations with all the major part international, and of course, EPP is, is, is part of that family. And uh, to start off, I, I'm, I'm an optimist, and to, to, to paraphrase uh, James Bond of, of all people, I, I would say that democracy uh, might be shaken, uh, but not stirred. Um, that's likely been disturbed or emotionally affected through the last years, but not deeply enough to change our behavior and our way of thinking. So I think it's important to, to acknowledge that, that the ties between allies, the ties between um, value states, democratic parties, global, they are still very, very strong. But what we've seen through the years, and that has been a huge problem for all the organizations and parties that we work with, we've seen that it has been, unfortunately, tempting for political parties and governments, um, even in the established democracies, to, to blend this kind of toxic political cocktail on populism. And, and we know that already before COVID-19 hit the world, we could see that there were authoritarian political leaders in Europe and in the rest of the world kind of, they were on the right. Um, we could see corruption, state capture, we could see opaque party organizations undermine the public uh, confidence in parties around the world fueling this kind of political instability. And that's a tragic situation. I'm, I'm, um, it's, it's so many different kind of shades of authoritarian leadership that we need to find new ways to, to, to challenge. Um, it could be from, from Putin to, to Duterte, from, from Orban to the Ayatollah, Ayatollahs in Iran and so on. And uh, the brutal attack uh, that shocked the world that we've seen, that we saw in, in Washington DC on January 6th, uh, I mean, of course, they were a shock for most of us. Um, it was sadness. It was a violent mob inspired by the president of the United States attacking the uh, American representative democracy. But that democracy stood very strong. And I think these ties uh, that the United States, together with European decent democratic political parties, have together are so crucial right now when we're kind of forming them, when we're forming the future. So I would say that. Strengthening unity among democracies is one of the major challenges for us that we need to work with on the coming year to, to make them um, multilateralism stronger again, um, 
to, to connect the transatlantic link and to work on issues like uh, um, uh, illiberal forces uh, pushing back against democracy and so on. So that's kind of some of the major priorities, I would say. And it's um, the authoritarian trend. It's, it's a global trend. It's not a trend in some parts of the world. So it's something that we need to, to work on together. Thank you, Brigitte. You mentioned the, the attacks on 6th of January in Washington. I know this is something which both NDI and IRI joined in a statement uh, in condemning and IRI's President Daniel Twining in Foreign Affairs in early January, just a couple of days after this, wrote a very good piece talking about the resilience of democracy, also the resilience of American democracy uh, in the face or in the in the wake of this and how uh, and how important this is still and how important it must continue to be uh, to reinforce in, in the face of what you've just talked about, the rising authoritarianism. So Jan, how would you see, how would you respond to the same question? What do you see as IRI's role now with all that is happening? How can we partner together? Yeah, thanks Nathan and, and Tono, great to see you. Bernita, great to work with you. Um, always a pleasure to be together with my friends at the EPP. Um, listen, Nathan, um, uh, I've been doing this work for almost 30 years now, right? Um, I started in the Clinton administration, right? Um, went through the George W. Bush administration, went through the Obama administration, went through the Trump administration, now the Biden administration. One thing is extremely clear to me, um, and that is that the support um, from both the Republican side and the Democrat side um, in the United States for the work that we do is rock solid, right? That doesn't waver, it doesn't change. Um, frankly, and I know this doesn't fit the narrative, but during the course of the Trump administration, whatever we think about the Trump administration, um, budgets for IRI and NDI both went up. And particularly in our part of the world, I'm coming to you today from Bratislava, Slovakia, as Nathan said, my sort of ancestral home. Um, in this part of the world, um, the budgets have escalated uh, even further and faster. Um, it, it always amazes me when the leader of NDI, uh, Derek Mitchell, and the leader of IRI, Dan Twining, go somewhere to an American audience and talk together about what we do, the broad and deep support there is for this work, right? Even among my, um, how shall I say this? Even among my Trumpier friends uh, in the United States, right, who are skeptical of foreign engagement, all right, and follow Trump down the path of trying to pull America back, right, to focus on America first. When you explain to them why it is that we do what we do, IRI and NDI together in the Democracy Assistance Universe, every single person I have ever seen in 30 years in this business supports what we do, right? Because this is a, is a tradition that goes back in American politics, at least to Woodrow Wilson, and probably, frankly, even before that. Um, so there is rock solid support from the Democrats in the House and the Democrats in the Senate and the Republicans in the House and the Republicans in the Senate. Um, and then frankly, from the institutions of any given administration, whether it's the State Department, certainly USAID, um, which mutually um, is our major funder, right? So I, I don't wanna be the one who tries to argue that, um, that things are never gonna change, but I, again, I'm old enough to know um, the, the pattern of things, right? And I expect that in the Biden administration, particularly given his commitment to the idea of a summit of the democracies or a summit for the democracies, um, and his, uh, his uh, 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 the statements of the new appointees to the administration um, in the wake of uh, uh, what the Chinese Communist Party did in Hong Kong earlier in the month and the protests in Russia over last weekend, I think, you know, frankly, the direction is all good. That's not to say that there aren't challenges, right? And I would argue this goes back something to, 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 to something that you said, Tono, and, and also Brigitte, to you. Listen, our, our approach is that um, the problems that we're facing, we're facing across the transatlantic community, right? Um, there is a very fundamental distrust among large parts of our populations, you name it. United States, Sweden, Spain, the EU more broadly, that simply don't believe that the system is performing for them anymore. It, they simply don't believe that the elected representatives that they send to their capitals are delivering for them. We need to figure out why that is, right? And we need to respond to it. Uh, because if we don't, collectively, as parties committed to democracy and democratic institutions, 
the institutions, there's going to be this undercurrent of distrust, which is not healthy for any of us at any time, right? So I think we need to be realistic. Um, the United States just came through a major challenge. I had no doubt that the institutions would succeed and would uh, would come through and would do their jobs. But to me, that's the message of the night of January 6th. Once the mob got cleared out, the Senate came back and the House came back and people did their jobs. They did what they got paid to do and what they were elected to do. To me, that's a democracy. Thank you, Jan. That was a very encouraging analysis and also a very important one. I think it's uh, I think it's very easy for people, you know, everywhere in the world to get lost or to get wrapped up in a lot of media hype, which is not always um, accurate or helpful uh, with regards to some of these important longstanding traditions and, and, and longstanding factors of resiliency. You invoked at least 100 years of American history there going back to Woodrow Wilson. So I want to come back to you, but then I want to ask the same question in reverse order to all of our panelists. And that is, uh, I, want to, I want to raise Henry Kissinger to whom it is uh, who is attributed, I think, is having said, you know, if you want to call Europe, who do you call? Or if you want to, if you want to reach Europe, who do you call? For the question is, well, how do you see the, how, how do you see the role of you specifically in this effort, in this joint effort to support, to promote, to defend democracy? So the, the role of the EU specifically. Sure. Uh, thanks, Nathan. Yeah, I call Tono. I don't know what anybody else does, but um, so listen. Um, I, these conversations are complicated, right? Um, because on some level, I think we all know that um, if um, the European Union is ever going to live up to the promise of the founders, um, it will need um, to grow, and it will need to develop, and it will need to stake out and defend territory, sometimes um, uh, without the support um, or even against the will, potentially in some situations, of the member states, right? So would I love um, a more aggressive um, uh, democracy engagement portfolio um, um, from the union itself? I absolutely would. Would I like to see more money um, committed to democracy assistance from the institutions of the union? I absolutely would, right? But I also know what's realistic and what's not realistic, right? Just as I know that USAID can't find all the funding that it necessarily wants um, in the debate in Washington. But what I do know is this: um, because of our relationship with the party, um, uh, the party internationals, um, and the parties um, at the European Union level, like the EPP, we are able to part to partner together to have influence in ex in countries that are looking to become members of the European Union and beyond. Right, we and you have done, I think, some very creative work um, in North Africa, um, in Lebanon, um, and other parts of the Middle East. Um, we have partnered with um, with uh, with you all uh, across Africa, across Asia, certainly in Latin America, right, where we have seen the destabilizing influence of the of the uh, Chavez Maduro cabal uh, in Venezuela and the ongoing problems created by. Um, the Castro clan in Cuba. Um, so I think the most important thing is for us to find ways to make sure that in the countries that we're working in and the places where we have representations, I know, for example, you guys are you know considering membership for several parties around the region, is for us to talk to each other and to, to share our experience in dealing with those parties, right? Because sometimes we see things that you don't, and sometimes you see things that we don't. Right. And in my experience, and this goes all the way back to the 90s, when the European Union and American organizations say the same thing to the same people at the same time, we're mostly like most likely to get the, the effect that we're looking for. Thank you, Jan. Brigitte, what's the role of the EU in supporting democracy? No, I think first we need to go back and strengthen the transatlantic link again. I mean, to, to make it really strong. And I mean, um, I mean, for me, it's, it's, it's purely beautiful for, for many reasons. I mean, it's based on long term friendship. It's joint sacrifice in wartime and peacetime fighting for, for democracy and values, I mean, versus fascism, communism, um, um, sometimes with arms, but always with strong ideas and ties together. So I think that's very important to go back and show that that true commitment, because we, we share a joint history in Europe and um, and the United States, and, and hopefully a prosperous future together also, um, 
we're interdependent of each other when it comes to security, democracy, values, trade, and many other fields. And I think this link is really strong and, and important, and the political parties are key here uh, from that from this. But also, I mean, to lead by example, it's very important to 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 lead the way and to walk the talk. So I think that's something. It's hard sometimes to be a, um, a global role model if you're not performing um, top quality back home. So that's also something we need to acknowledge that. Uh, that to kind of mirror ourselves, um, uh, to share our strong values that, that we have and, and to broaden these kind of uh, partnerships. And I think we've, we've seen some, some good initiatives already. I mean, the Biden ad administrations, they are new, but they've already, um, I think with their appointments, um, um, showed great commitment when it comes to both USAID um, and, and also to, to, to Tony Biden as the new Minister of Foreign Affairs, State Secretary and so on. So I think we can see, we can, we can have good hopes from, from, this, from this angle. And I, uh, for sure, I, Ryan and I would have very close uh, ties together when we work with these issues like we've always been doing. And uh, the statement that, that you mentioned, Nathan, before uh, during this um, terrifying um, tonight, what happened in, in, in the United States um, uh, with, at Capitol Hill, I mean, that was a very strong statement, um, and also with other actors that joined together from from different uh, from the different two different political parts. So that's that's important to to kind of see where it is. But from the European Union side, I think I mean everyone needs to kind of step it up when it comes to democracy support. But I think we've seen um, both from the Foreign Affairs Council, uh, I mean new initiatives both on multilateralism. Uh, we have the the Franco-German thing on multilateralism. Um, we've seen that. Um, that um, that it is some new initiatives, and also from individual countries. I mean, I, I think one of the role models is actually happening here in in my home country of Sweden, where we have the drive for democracy. That is one of the most kind of ambitious right now um, initiatives on on supporting in the, uh, democracy fighters around the world. So I think it's it's important to build on all these things, but also to see that the transatlantic link is so important here because that's one of the strongest democratic ties that we had in history. So, so Sherry Stefan. I'm so glad we did this because the more I listen to all of you, the more encouraged I, I am, even despite all the challenges that, that exist. Secretary General, I know you travel to Washington, you, you talk to international leaders around Europe and around the world. And one of the things I know you're very committed to is explaining the European Union, not only the perspective of Spain or of the European Parliament, but of the European Union. How do you explain this to citizens? How do you explain it to other international leaders? Well, I will try because what Jan said is very interesting. And I would like to make a historical approach. Be aware, I'm not going to be short. In what many of us will want is the United States of Europe. Is this going on? No. We are in a process. We don't know if this will end as a United States of Europe in the future or not. So our dream will be to have a single phone. I'm saying this to our American listeners. Huh? Uh, that's our dream. But still we are in the process. May I recall everybody that it took a civil war to define this in the United States of America? Because I do remember that there were two models, a confederate one and a federal one. Uh, our dream is also that this construction would not be decided uh, by an internal civil war. Mm -hmm. But together, uh, with big fights that we have every day, every, every European Council is a fight, uh, which is normal, you know, between capitals and Brussels and, uh, you know, taking powers, giving them back and so on. Okay, no big deal. I don't think I will see the end of this process. But I wish that my daughters would see that. Because for this common fight for democracy, and let me say so, I think that was a mistake by President Trump. And uh, also, President Obama was not also very keen uh, in the question, the European question. Remember about the failure of the trade agreement and so on. There has been some distance these latest years. And no, it is in the interest of the United States of America. And I know I'm speaking with people that they share this view, absolutely. And I know for many years. Huh? And they do represent huh? many thousands of politicians in those parties huh? which believe the same. It is in the interest of the United States and democracy in the world that there is a united Europe. 
because then a united Europe can help in this. Separated, divided, no. Uh, and uh, separated and divided Europe has a history that's not, let's say, very, uh, uh, let's say, a good history, you know, because we export to world wars because of our differences and so on. Now we channel all this energy uh, to also now spread our values and our principles. For the very first time, the European flag to many countries means something good. Uh, I have to recall that the Spanish flag, the French flag, the British flag are not so welcome in many parts of the world. There is some, let's say, memories about the past. Uh, uh, but the European flag is very different. It is received with uh, welcoming hands, welcoming arms in many countries. Let's take that location. Let's, let's use that location. We are not also, let's say, a uh, military power now, uh, but we have our trade, we have our economy, our sanctions that uh, so much molest uh, some regimes like in Venezuela, very well mentioned, Jan. Uh, uh, and finally, about democracy in the world. And I, I will follow, and we are already, Redita, working in EPP to follow the question of this uh, democracy forum of the future and so on. Uh, remember, we want Venezuela and Cuba not admitted in this club. Because, uh, Carol, when you have Venezuela and Cuba leading the activities in the Human Rights Committee in Geneva, in the United Nations, there is certain, you know, uh, you know, uh, how to put it, hypocrisy in all this. That a country like Venezuela, that, he, that has been accused by the own United Nations of crimes against humanity, is a still member of the Human Rights Committee of the United Nations in Geneva. Enough is enough. I hope that in the next forum, these countries will be pointed as what they are. Uh, and I'm sure, and I'm sure that that will be, that will be the case. Huh? Uh, this is a very important point, huh? and we have to select very well huh? who will be members of this club or not. And this will not be based on ideological approaches. This will be based in facts about what is the degree of democracy in these countries. We are ready to collaborate, and we are willing to do so. Uh, in order to have the most successful, and we are, uh, I'm telling you, uh, we support the issue, uh, and uh, when it, whenever it comes. I know that now it's happening on our domestic agenda, because there are many things to be solved. Uh, uh, but uh, when the moment comes, we want to be there, also to define this momentum. And together, the European Union and the United States. If we are together in this, no one can beat us. Uh, no one will escape uh, the scrutiny uh, and, the, and the defense of our principles if we do it today. You're a lover of history and your historical perspective is always invaluable. I have one more serious question for each of you and then one more, one fun question to finish with. Uh, and it touches on the serious question, touches on what Secretary General just mentioned, uh, the, this, this potential summit of democracies and the challenges which would be involved because it's not necessarily a given who would be included, what the agenda would be, how some of these issues would be sorted out. Jan, you also mentioned this. So um, with that sort of as a, you know, in the, as the context, the question is simply, what does democracy have to offer? You know, what is the, why is democracy specifically liberal democracy? Why is it better than the alternatives, which, which are, which are, which are, as Brigitte said, gaining ground in many places. Maybe Brigitte, you could answer this one first and then Jan and finally the Secretary General. You know, that's a very good question. That's a very good question. But I think, frankly, right now we're in a situation where allies need to unite. And I'm not talk only talking about countries or, or unions like European unions and the United States. But I think also when it comes to political parties, we need to unite. I mean, decent values based democratic parties, no matter if they're, they're conservatives or liberals or, or social democrats or greens or whatever, they need to unite. So I think that's a very good standpoint. And I think it's important when we're discussing the, the coming global summit for democracy and, and um, I mean, the Biden administration apparently right now are, are working on the concept, what it should be. But I think it's important to see that it's not only a governmental affair, 
um, so it's something more. But it should not only be then civil society invited. I think it's important that that uh, good, strong, values-based, decent political parties also feel that they can have a have a good chance to be part of, of 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 this discussion. So that's something that I think we need to to to, to focus on. Thanks, Brigitte. Jan, what do you what do you think about this potential summit of democracies? You know, Nathan, uh, so much of this, I think, um, I agree with everything Brigitte just said, um, but I, I think in addition to that, so much of the importance of the summit when it comes to pass um, will be about sending a message, right? Um, we all collectively have engaged in the transatlantic space over the last several years in a sort of a mer merciless race to the bottom and self-doubt um, about our systems and whether or not they're actually uh, better for the people. Um, maybe not the four of us in this conversation, but lots of people in our societies have, right? And, um, you know, I, I, uh, it is, it is evident to me by just a cursory glance around the world, around Europe and across the United States and North America, that democracy um, offers the best chance for the most people to improve their quality of life um, uh, uh, that exists. We know it's not perfect, right? We know it has flaws. We know it lets people down. We know it doesn't live up to its ideals. Certainly the American system doesn't live up to its ideals laid out by our founders, right? In the Declaration of the Constitution. But that's not the point, right? Um, there's this great story. I was, I was super fortunate um, to be able to take my then, let's see, that 11 year old son um, to John McCain's funeral. Um, in uh, 2018, it's only two years ago, a little bit more than two years ago, feels like an eternity, right? Um, a little bit more than two years ago at the, the funeral service at the National Cathedral in Washington. And, um, you know, of all the people who spoke, President Obama spoke, President Bush spoke, Henry Kissinger spoke, to, uh, Tono, to go back to the question about who calls whom, where, when. Um, but the story that I remember most um, from that day is Megan uh, McCain, the Senator's daughter who told this story about, um, she was a little girl um, and the Senator was teaching her how to ride a horse. And um, the horse threw her and she hit the ground and broke her collarbone. And you know, a collarbone break's not gonna kill you, but it hurts like hell, right? Um, and so the Senator picked her up, got her to the doctor, got it taken care of, brought her home and put her right back on that same horse, right? And she tells this story at the funeral to say, I hated him when he put me back on that horse, but I love him for it now, right? And it seems to me that's where we are in the community of democracies right now, right? We've got to get back on the horse, right? It's been a tough time, right? We've sent conflicting messages. We've done some things and said some things that ultimately are not supportive of our message that democracy is the best system. But I will guarantee you every single dollar or euro that I've got in my bank account that no one in Hong Kong cares whether or not whatever happened on January 6th in the United States, as long as they know that the United States comes out in support of their positions against what the Chinese Communist Party is doing, right? Just the same as nobody in Belarus gives a damn what goes on in Stockholm, as long as the government of Sweden comes out and supports them in their fight against Lukashenko, right? That's what matters, right? And that's part of what the summit needs to do. It needs to lay down, um, uh, the law, frankly, and say that we are all committed as democracies to making sure that more people around the world benefit from this imperfect system that we have managed to make work for so long. Thank you. I'm going to remember that story um, for a long time, I think. So that was a very helpful, colorful anecdote and a perfect segue for the Secretary General, who I know worked with Senator McCain to strengthen transatlantic relations, party to party dialogue, uh, mutual understanding as a basis, as an anchor for all the things which we've been talking about today. So for this final, let's say, serious portion of the conversation, Secretary General Rose is the last word. Well, uh, I'm going to be very brief, following the example of someone that I admire, and uh, many in our political family in Europe, we, we admire and respect, and we hold dear, and we have in our thoughts, uh, John McCain. Because speaking of him, I would say the following. Uh, thousands and thousands of Americans died to defend democracy in the past in Europe. Now it's time not to have thousands and thousands of Europeans or Americans to die for the coast. 
we are on time, Jan just said it, we still are on time to do it right. We have to be very smart, we have powerful enemies, very attractive. Uh, they are helped by, uh, let's say, a confusing communication that's going on around the world and the media, but they have to find also their way in all this. We are all affected by the new technologies, the new revolutions, you know, but we start to have all to do our work. This is the only way to avoid what happened in the past. Uh, it's not about the thousands of people dying in beaches, you know, to save their lives. Should have been done in another way. We should have presented, prevented that. That is the lesson that it was learned of what happened. Uh, me, I'm proud also of being a member of this European Union that is trying to avoid that past in uh, Now we are faced with the same nightmare scenario. Populism, uh, extremism, uh, uh, life, right and left. Uh, uh, again, the Eastern communism, fascism, you know, appearing in the horizon, disguised uh, in populism versions in Europe. Uh, remember what happened last time when we let this happen and continue. We are on time, ladies and gentlemen, and we have to work together. And uh, again, this is a perfect example in the same way that we are all together. I know that he was the one first wanted to know IRI and the I. Uh, and it's now, uh, you know, all these activities that they are sharing together. I think this is part of the power now to have such basic important organizations for all of us uh, working in some of these cases together. Uh, in some countries, as we have seen, uh, the work together of NDI and the IAI, and also the activities of both direct directors, you know, it's, it's essential in this. Uh, because together, uh, we are always uh, more effective. So let's work for that. Uh, my my hope message is we are on time still yet, uh, but uh, as Barnier might say, the clock is ticking eh, eh, and, uh, and uh, we have to do it now. Thank you. All of you have given very serious but also seriously optimistic, I think, analyses uh, uh, of what's happening now as well as next steps for what you might expect in the coming months. Uh, so I think that's been encouraging to me at least, and I hope also for our viewers, I wanna thank all of you. I wanna also end on a more human touch as we try to do with all of our Family Talks interviews. And that's simply to ask each of you briefly what book or film or series you might recommend now to our viewers. So I would start uh, maybe again with Jan and then go to Brigitte and then with our Secretary General. What, what are you reading, watching now, which you would recommend? So because this is a transatlantic discussion, I'm gonna pick one European contribution and one American if I can. Um, super quick, um, the German language series Babylon Berlin, um, the original novels written by Volker Kuchar about um, the sort of underside of life in uh, Berlin during the Weimar, the Weimar Republic. Super interesting sort of illumination from the bottom of what happens when the system doesn't work. Um, also reworked into a television series now going into its production on its fourth season. That's on the European side and on the American side. You know, I have never liked Leonardo DiCaprio, um, but um, he produced um, a series on Ulysses S. Grant, um, which just showed on the History Channel. Um, it's, I think, a three or four part series on Grant, you know, coming up through the ranks um, in the army, running uh, the, the northern uh, uh, fight for, in the Civil War and then his time as president, hugely illustrative of um, how so much of the tension we see in the United States goes all the way back, right? Um, at least to the Civil War period and before. Uh, super series, easy to watch, quick and easy, highly recommended. I'm not sure if it's based on the Ron Chernow biography, which was excellent. It is, absolutely, yes. Well, then, then that's definitely going to the top of my queue. So, uh, Graham was a fascinating person. He, would walk, walk in his dusty, muddy boots and soldier's uniform as general alongside of his troops with his chewed out cigar in his mouth. So, Brigitte, what about you? What are you reading? What are you watching now that we you might recommend to us? Mm -hmm. well, well, we need to acknowledge that democracy is a never ending journey. It's not a destination, so we need to fight every day. And, um, and then you need to know your enemies too. And um, um, my reference comes from a truly transatlantic person, the chairperson of NDI and former Secretary of State, Madeleine Fulbright. And uh, 
uh, and um, she wrote, I mean, this book, it came in, Swe it came in Swedish recently, um, Fascism of Warning, and I think this, and she has also humor, even though it's a very, very serious topic, so I would definitely recommend that. And also to, for everyone to remember, as it says here on my coffee cup, that it's no democracy without Democrats, and that's why we're supporting Democrats around the world um, every single day, because um, you cannot impose democracy from um, from above. You need to identify the agents of change, the people that are truly committed to the values that NDI and IRI are fighting for together. Democrats and Republicans, Berdia. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you don't have a job, huh? You have to... <laughs> well, excellent. And Secretary General, finally to you, what are your recommendations for us? Uh, well, uh, I'm a, well, first my book, because uh, um, I, first of all, I have to warn you, it's very boring, it's very academical, it's called The Roman Revolution, but it's about an episode of this uh, Roman history that I am particularly interested always, it's the question of the change from the Republic to the Empire, uh, uh, through the figure of Augustus. Uh, and. Uh, Everybody speaks about Caesar, Julius Caesar, but I think that the most intriguing and uh, factor in all this was uh, Caius Octavius Augustus. Uh, to be read with interest, not this book, but if you find anything you know more interesting, more let's say uh, didactic about this change, it could also illuminate you about you know what what's also going in our history right now. I'm a fanatic of history because I think that in politics, like things in life, when you have to take decisions. To know history is to advance huh? also what will happen in the next future because unfortunately history repeats sometimes itself and we have to be aware of that. Second, uh, films, I'm a Netflix fan, and I guess millions of people right now <laughs> because of the pandemic, unfortunately. And uh, the film I would recommend vividly is the one, the new version of Henry the Fifth, it's called The King. Um, fantastic film uh, that uh, is now in Netflix. Uh, and second, why not? I mean, this, this, I'm sure you're all familiar now with this, uh, this uh, documentary called Social Dilemma uh, that everybody is now aware of. I mean, uh, if you want to do politics in the United States, in Europe, uh, everywhere, you know, I mean, you need to know. Uh, you need to understand what's going on and how to cope with this. Very interesting, and I recommend, I'm recommending this to a lot of young politicians now. In, uh, in my country in Spain to follow this with interest, huh? because maybe we could change this line and as, as legislators, huh, we have to the power to do so. Huh? Not against anyone, but to correct this situation, uh, you know, I think it's crucial. I take the occasion, Nathan, to thank uh, both uh, Jan and uh, Gita. I think it's very interesting. We should do it again. I think that uh, not signing off, but uh, you know, I mean, I think it's, uh, you know, would be very good. And uh, also to produce, you know, good, good, good cases huh, of cooperation between the organizations. Huh? Us, I have to tell viewers, we we'll profit a lot in EPP, thanks to the common work of NEI and IRI. This has been also for us uh, very important in uh, key countries where we have big problems as Europeans, like Belarus, like Ukraine, uh, and some others. Uh, and we, uh, close work and the cooperation and also the common fight about these two organizations is also for us Europeans fundamental. Thank you for that. It's always so enlightening to hear what our colleagues and leaders are thinking about, not only as leaders, but as human beings as well. So I just joined the Secretary General in thanking you all again for this very uh, insightful, very interesting, engaging and important discussion. Jan Sorochak, Senior Director for Transatlantic Strategy at the National Republican Institute. Brigitte Olsen, Director of Political Parties at the National Democratic Institute, and our own EPP Secretary General and Member of the European Parliament, Antonio Lopez of Stewart. Thank you all so much. Have a great afternoon and hope to see you again very soon for all of the important uh, work which continues and will continue for some time to come. So goodbye, all of you, and see you again to our viewers next time for our next episode of EPP Family I'm Talks. Dying, I'm dying to see you in Washington. I want to go there. Huh? So.